Off we go with an 1897 Drummond 060 and a tour of the Nine Elms Motor Power Depot of the Southern Region British Railways as it used to be in the early 60s. We see repair work is in progress whilst other locomotives are standing cold. Merchant Navy class locomotives, Shaw Saddle, Elders Fife, Bibby Line, as well as other engines are seen here preparing for their run. We will leave Nine Elms with a view of a channel packet number 35001 heading the Bournemouth Bell at speed towards Waterloo. On the Isle of Man in 1964, we filmed the Bayer Peacock locomotives built in 1905. G.H. Wood number 10 and Maitland number 11 at Castle Down and Douglas stations in maroon livery before their more recent repaint for the present green. From the Isle of Man, we go to Marylebone Station and we will take a look at some of the Stainer Black Fives. Black Fives were very popular with the engine men who drove them. They would all agree with a statement made by one of these men. 
he said of the Black Fives, it was a wonderful machine. Simple to drive, not sensitive to individual driver's techniques, easy to fire, and quite effective with a thick fire or a thin one. Steady on its feet, and comfortable to ride on. Could a man want for more? Rivers and wide estuaries meant little to the 19th century railway builders. The bridge over the Firth of Forth was at the time of its construction and completion in 1890, the largest in the world, one and a half miles long. As in all bridge construction, the Forth Bridge took its toll of life. During the seven years it took to build the bridge, 60 men paid that toll. Originally, the design of the fourth bridge was to be based on its forerunner, the Tay Bridge, a girder-type bridge built in 1878 by Sir Thomas Booch. Plans and preparations were underway to begin the actual work on the fourth bridge when the Tay Bridge disaster occurred. It was just six months after Queen Victoria crossed the bridge on her way to Balmoral, having knighted Sir Thomas Booch for his construction, that the bridge fell. It was such a stormy night so high were the winds that local people worried for the safety of the bridge. As the night mail train hurtled across the bridge, the winds seemed to reach hurricane force and caused a half-mile section of the bridge to collapse, taking the train with it into the freezing waters of the Firth of Tay. There were no survivors. Seventy-eight people lost their lives in this disaster. Sir Thomas Booch was immediately taken off his work on the fourth bridge. An inquiry was made into the disaster. It was decided by the committee that not enough allowance was made for wind strength in the design of the bridge. And with this knowledge fresh in their minds, they recommended a new design with a much greater safety factor for the Firth of Forth Bridge. The Forth Bridge was to have been a suspension bridge when designed by Sir Thomas Booch. But the newly appointed designers, Sir John Fowler and Sir Benjamin Baker, decided to build a cantilever bridge of steel. Inchgurvy Island was used to build the central pier. There are two other double cantilevers, and each one is 360 feet high. The process of balance was controlled in the building of this bridge, as each arm was built simultaneously out from the centre for a distance of 680 feet.
Even so, there still left a gap of 350 feet between the cantilever arms, and this was filled with a girder section. The bridge now carries a double-track railway across the Firth of Forth at a height of 157 feet. The completed bridge height from the base of the deepest pier to the top of the tower above is equal to that of the second pyramid of Egypt. It is twice as high as the Newcastle High Level Bridge and would stretch exactly from St Paul's Cathedral to the York Column in Waterloo Place in London. Painters have a never-ending job covering the 135 acres of steel. In the autumn of 1964, five years after this film was made, construction was completed on the road suspension bridge, and it was opened by Queen Elizabeth II. The view now consists of a large cantilever bridge of steel nearly 100 years old, and a 16 million pound suspension bridge for road traffic, replacing the car ferries.
One of the most famous expresses is the Royal Scots. Every day, winter and summer, in peace and war, an engine driver and fireman have come to get the engine ready to take the Royal Scot out of Euston at 10 o'clock. The drivers of these crack expresses take great pride in their responsible job, and getting the engine ready is not just an empty phrase. The driver leaves nothing to chance and makes a personal inspection, carefully oiling and checking everything. Tons of coal will be used on the run. Slowly, the driver backs the great locomotive onto the turntable. Under her own power, she turns herself round, ready to go down to Euston. 150 tons of British steel. waiting on platform 13. But the superstitious need have no qualm. She's made the run regularly year after year. About 400 people travel every day on this famous train and millions must have made the journey since it started. The guard checks final details with the engine driver. All is ready. The smooth, easy departure of a big train requires the synchronization of hundreds of planned and timed events. The station foreman gives the ready to the signal box and a whole series of signals and points are set electrically for the departure of the Royal Scot. The off lights up to indicate that the road is clear. Traditionally, the station master has the final word. And at 10 o'clock, the R for right away lights up over the up. The Royal Scot pulls out on the start of its 400 mile journey. To help her up the gradient to Camden, a banker engine pushes from behind. Steam surging at full pressure, the Royal Scot forges up the slope. She gathers speed now and leaves the banker behind. runs towards the darkness of the first tunnel out of London. That was Kensal Rise. There are 52,000 miles of track in Britain equivalent to nine million tons of railway lines, all made of steel. Running at speed, we easily overtake a good straight, the backbone of the railway system. The bumpity bump, or rhythm of the rails, is caused by the wheels passing over the joints. The rails on the main line are laid in 60 foot lengths, so there are 88 bumps to the mile. From this, the mathematically minded can work out the speed of the train. There's no time to stop to refill the tanks, so she scoops up water from troughs between the rails. Scott 
uses something like 20,000 gallons of water on the journey. 75 miles from London, the Scot approaches Killsby Tunnel. Above us is the house where the gunpowder plot was hatched. Killsby is the seventh and longest tunnel going north. The martello-like towers, 120 feet above the track, let the smoke out. The Scot roars out at the other end, nearly a mile and a half further on. Seven miles ahead is Rugby, where the game originated in 1823. For the fifth time since leaving Euston, the Scot picks up more than a thousand gallons of water. And so to Wigan. The railwayman and his watch are inseparable. Four hours from London is Lancaster Castle with John O'Gorn's gate. Beyond lies the Lake District and one of the highest railway points in England, Shap Summit, with a climb of 1 in 75. The powerful locomotive takes this gradient without a banker engine. She makes up time and rolls down to Shap Station at maximum speed. Few people have had the thrill of riding on the front of an express train at this rate. In the next 10 miles, the line is crossed by 21 bridges on the way to Penrith. By the way, there are 400 bridges between Euston and Carlisle. At Carlisle, engines are changed in winter after the 300-mile run. The waiting engine, the city of Chester, is soon coupled and the Royal Scot pulls out on the second stage of the journey. Then on to the border. The first house in Scotland. And the smithy where horses were shot at leisure and couples married in haste. But the railway crosses the river Sark over the bridge with the Rose of England on one side and the thistle of Scotland on the other. The signalman watches her flying through at Gretna Junction. of Dumfrieshire slowly give way to the grandeur of the Scottish scene as she wins her way north through the steel-making towns of Lanarkshire to the great city and port of Glasgow. Pulling into the central station dead on time, the Royal Scot receives her traditional welcome, for she is, of course, the first train to arrive in Glasgow from London every day. The end of the run, but only for the Royal Scot. The rhythm of the rails will go on all the time, even in the new age of electrification and diesel-powered locomotives. Goods trains will travel in the wake of famous passenger services, bound for cities, towns and ports, at every point on Britain's 52,000 miles of steel railway track. Thank you.
Thank you.